Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Thomas for inviting me for organizing this meeting, uh, especially. And I sh sh shall I use uh, this? It's easy. Is this better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to talk about quantum superpositions mainly. The, the, the talk relates to, to certain papers which I, are here and I, I'm going to show them after the, the talk if, if, in case you're interested. So what I'm going to talk about is the way in which uh, foundations of quantum mechanics and philosophy of quantum mechanics are dealing with quantum superpositions and kind of problematic perspective that I believe is, is, uh, is within that very specific perspective. Uh, so I'm going to start by discussing about re realism in physical theory. I believe that physical theories are related, interrelated uh, structures which on the one have, hand have uh, mathematical structures, on the other hand have concepts, and through this interrelation of mathematical structures and conceptual schemes, it is possible to create a field of phenomena, to, to think in terms of those concepts. Now, this is not new, this is kind of very common to the ideas of Einstein, of Schrödinger, of uh, Heisenberg, which had, of course, a very neo-Kantian perspective with respect to physics. So, some remarks just to, to be clear about this point, which I, I believe is of deep importance. Our scheme does not go in line with empiricism, of course, which assumes that observability, that observations in a lab are self-evident givens, that, for example, for example, a chair or a table are as well self evident things which are unproblematic, and it's from observability that theories are created, mathematical schemes rather than, than what I would call a theory. And then you have, of course, within the empiricist scheme, the problem of interpretation and of relating that mathematical schemes to the data. It doesn't go also in line with naive realism, which also assumes this type of observability perspective. So within, within this scheme, a very deep important point is that observability is metaphysically laden. You can only observe in relation to, to the development of the theory, in conceptual terms. So of course here, some guys that we all know Hume, who argued explicitly that the causation is not empirically grounded, and in that sense it is a way of presupposing experience in a certain very specific manner. This was, of course, extended by Immanuel Kant, who argued that phenomena is always categorically constrained, at least objective type of phenomena. So objectivity is a way of constructing the object through the transcendental subject certain specific uh, categorical scheme which allows you to claim that you have an object. And this goes also in line with Einstein's perspective regarding physical theories and something that in a discussion with Heisenberg was explicitly uh, discussed. Heisenberg, Einstein told to Heisenberg and this, this is according to Heisenberg what led him to the indetermination relations, it is only the theory which decides what can be observed. More explicitly, according to Heisenberg, and I quote, the history of physics is not only a sequence of experimental discoveries and observations followed by the mathematical description. It is also a history of concepts. For an understanding of the phenomena, the first condition is the introduction of adequate concepts. Only with the help of correct concepts can we really know 
what has been observed. So, just to sum up, representation of realism, which is the, the stance I am proposing here, it's an old stance, it's not, it's not mine, I'm just recovering from, from many of the founding fathers of the theory. A representation of realist account of a physical theory must be capable of providing a physical representation of reality in terms of a network of physical concepts, which coherently relate to the mathematical formalism of the theory and allows them to articulate, make predictions of definite phenomena. Observability in physics is thus always theoretically and metaphysically laden, and thus it must be regarded as a consequence of each particular physical representation. Physics represents reality in a formal conceptual manner. Now, how this physical representation relates to reality is another problem which I'm not going to discuss in this talk. That's a kind of different type of problem. It is very common within the foundational literature to hear things like, according to quantum mechanics, the structure of the world is like Hilbert space, all quantum particles are described by normalized factors, and I'm arguing against this type of understanding of physics, which is very mathematically uh, approached. Because a mathematical formalism, according to the perspective I'm defending, does not grasp the qualitative understanding of what is going on. And this is one of the most important things about physics, that it allows us to create thought and representation and in this manner also experience in a third-person manner in the way that I can explain you, for example, even if you were a layman, quantum electromagnetics or electromagnetism, the theory of Maxwell, and I could explain you what a field is and we could make thought experiments with these ideas, and not only with the mathematics. So, Gedanken experiments, I believe, are a very good example of the way in which physics elaborates experience and develops this experience even beyond the technical capabilities of their time. And in physics, it's full of such examples, especially in quantum mechanics, the EPR experiment, Schrodinger's cat experiment. I mean, they are all thought ideas that uh, had to wait many years in order to be actually performed or even developed. So, uh, taking this position regarding representation as uh, something very important within physics, there is, a, of course, a challenge, and that is to create a representation for quantum mechanics, a conceptual representation. And from this challenge, we can see that there are two main possibilities. One would be to believe that quantum mechanics relates to a classical representation. So, to, to classical mechanics, to classical objects, that the metaphysics implied by quantum mechanics can be matched to the classical metaphysics. And this is the path, of course, of Bohmian mechanics, GRW, model interpretations, and many other interpretations within the foundational uh, arena. A different perspective, which I am more sympathetic with, is the idea that quantum mechanics does not make reference to classical reality, that in fact it talks about a new idea of reality, a new representation of reality, which goes beyond classical metaphysics. So what needs to be related to physical reality? I, I think that this quotation by Robert Griffiths captures a little bit the, the, the physical intuition that, that's in this type of, of, of debate. Griffiths says, if a theory makes a certain amount of sense and gives predictions which agree reasonably well with experimental observation of results, scientists are inclined to believe that its logical and mathematical structure reflects the structure of the real world in some way. 
even if philosophers will remain permanently skeptical. Of course, here what is missing is the metaphysics. By metaphysics, I am not talking about an observable uh, a discourse about the unobservable. I am talking about the systematic characterization of concepts in terms of networks. So, for example, just to give you a, a, an example, classical mechanics has a specific type of metaphysics. When we talk about classical mechanics, we talk about objects in space-time, particles in space-time. Now, these particles that we have learned to talk about are based on certain very general principles, like principle of existence, <coughs> principle of non-contradiction, principle of identity. It is these principles which capture, capture the notion of physical object in terms of classical mechanics. Now, the notions that are related in classical mechanics, like force, mass, uh, particle, speed, are not found in the mathematical formalism, though. You cannot derive them. They're not derivable through theorems. I cannot derive the notion of particle. I, I have to make an entanglement. And this, these two parts are in different levels. So, the same happens in, in, in electro, electromagnetism. We have Maxwell's equation, and then we have created the notion of field. The notion of field is deeply important in order to understand Maxwell's equations in a way in which we can develop experience, we can understand what we are talking about. And that's one of the main differences between physics and mathematics. So, taking this idea of, uh, of Robert Griffiths, I define what is a meaningful operational statement. Every operational statement within a theory capable of predicting the outcomes of possible measurements must be considered as meaningful with respect to the representation of physical reality provided by that theory. And counterfactual reason also, which is a main element of physical discourse. This is, if a theory is empirically adequate, then the meaningful operational statement it provides must be related to physical reality, to the representation of physical reality, through a conceptual scheme. The possibility to make meaningful operational statements related to an objective physical representation requires necessar necessarily a counterfactual reasoning. Meaningful operational statements are not necessarily statements about future events. They can be also statements about past or present events. Counterfactual reasoning about meaningful operational statements comprises all actual and non-actual physical experience. Of course, in an operational manner. So, we could say that counterfactual reasoning is an objectivity condition for physical discourse. What are the necessary conditions that would, would uh, need for the development of the representation of realism in terms of now thinking more in terms of quantum mechanics, well, every physical theory must be capable of producing meaningful operational statements. So, the type of statements that, if I do this, then this will happen, this kind of prediction, that I don't know what I'm talking about yet. Every meaningful operational statement that theory produces must be then related to the representation that theory is talking about, and that is what I need to create. And this representation is, of course, provided through specific concepts, through a specific conceptual scheme, which explains the phenomena. I'm going to say something very obvious, but I cannot discuss about Maxwell's equations in terms of fields unless I have the notion of field. The possibility to go to a representational level requires that movement. The third necessary condition is that the conceptual representation of physical reality must be capable of producing a coherent counterfactual physical discourse, which includes all the meaningful operational statements the theory is making. So with these necessary conditions, let's discuss a little bit one of the most infamous problems in quantum mechanics, the measurement problem, which basically says that given a specific basis, 
quantum mechanics describes mathematically a quantum state in terms of a superposition. So I, I choose a specific context or basis, then I, I represent a quantum state, let's say, in the following way. It's a superposition of spin up and spin down, let's say. And then there is a result. Then we have a result. And then the problem is how to explain the path from the quantum superposition to the result. Well, I think that one of the main responsible for this type of problem is Niels Bohr and his metaphysical presuppositions. One of them relates to the representation of phenomena in terms of classical physics, of the theories of Maxwell and Newton. So, so, so the idea that uh, the ambiguous interpretation of any measurement must be essentially framed in terms of classical physical theories. And we may say that in this sense, the language of Newton and Maxwell will remain the language of physics for all time. And yet, it would be a misconception to believe that the difficulties of the atomic theory may be evaded by eventually replacing the concepts of classical physics by new conceptual forms. So, the classical representation is basic for describing any type of phenomenon, even quantum. And then the idea of a correspondence principle a reductionistic bridge between quantum mechanics and classical physics. This then could be related to, to, to this, uh, what I call the two dogmas, the two body and dogmas of orthodoxy, which are playing a, a, an important role in the present discussions in foundational debates. One is the quantum to classical limit, the idea that the principle that one needs to find a bridge this is a reductionistic metaphysical conception which could work. I'm not denying that it, it can work, but it has failed until now. I mean, we don't have such a such a such a limit. We have not been able to explain this limit. The coherence, which is one of the main possibilities, has been uh, has been clearly not capable of, of of going from the quantum explaining the path from quantum mechanics to classical physics. And the other one is the principle that one needs to presuppose the classical representation in the interpretation of quantum mechanics. And this is also a very well, doubtable metaphysical principle that we should, well, after more than one century of being unable to do so, regard with certain suspicious. So, the, the perspective that is playing a very important role at this moment in foundational debate has created this set of no problems, as I call them. Uh, also, Bob Kuke has, has used this, this type of, of reference. So, we have a lot of no problems. The problems of no individuality, no separability, no locality, no distributivity. And they all come from trying to understand quantum mechanics in terms of classical physical concepts. So we use separability because we know that chairs are separable, and then we find out that quantum mechanics is non separable. We use locality because we know that chairs live in space time, and then we find out that, well, that there are some problems with space time and locality in quantum mechanics. And so on. You know, so, so, so the problematic is focused on the justification of the classical realm. And this, of course, has to be with very metaphysical perspective with respect to what is the work that physics needs to do. We know a lot of things about quantum superpositions. So we know that the existence of superposition, regardless of the effectuation of the terms, of one of its terms, that they refer to contradictory properties if we think that projection operators are thought in terms of properties. We know about the non-standard root to equality. 
We know, most importantly, of the non-classical interference of different quantum superpositions, so what could be considered the interaction of the terms, which in fact are related to possibilities. So we're talking about interaction of possibilities. And that's difficult to think in classical terms, of course. We know, of course, a lot of things that are being done today in laboratories. Laboratories are advancing much faster than what is being done in philosophy of quantum mechanics, according to my perspective. And this is because they're just working with quantum superpositions. They, 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 they're just doing stuff. Instead of trying to understand them in classical terms. So, what I believe would be a very important question for philosophy of quantum mechanics would be to concentrate not in the actual result, but in trying to find out how to think about the mathematical element which describes a quantum superposition. What is the concept that we need to build in order to be able to grasp what quantum mechanics is talking about? Clearly, the notion of particle doesn't match the requirements. So, just let me give a very specific definition of, of uh, superpositions because many times in the debates the notion of superposition is entangled to that of quantum particle, quantum state, pure state, and of course I want to distinguish them very clearly in a contextual manner. So, given a quantum state psi, each basis represents a particular way of a, a particular mathematical representation of psi and in general we will obtain a sum, a linear combination of, of states in that basis. So each one of these different basis dependent quantum positions defines a specific set of meaningful operational statements. That's also something we know. These meaningful operational statements are related to each one of the terms of the particular quantum superposition through the Bohm rule. The notion of quantum superposition is first contextual, for it is always defined in terms of a particular experimental context or basis. I'm, I'm talking here in mathematical terms. So, what is what we can say about superpositions and the actual realm. And the actual realm, I, I, I take it to be defined in terms of the metaphysical principles of existence, non-contradiction and identity, as Aristotle proposed in his metaphysics. So the principle of existence is the one that allows me to claim that this is an existence, the principle of non-contradiction, allows me to claim that this existence has no contradictory properties. And only if I add the principle of identity, I can claim that this existence, which has no contradictory properties, is the same through time. So at this metaphysical level, I have created the notion of object, which requires, of course, this metaphysical type of representation. And of course, quantum superpositions are kind of very problematic with respect to this understanding of the actual real. You know, the idea that one can represent reality in terms of an actual state of affairs. An idea which has been really uh, very powerful since Newton. Newton conceives that particle small objects have properties, and these properties are of course definite, and the picture that we have is that of an actual state of affairs. Now, and we can conceive all classical physics, even relativity theory, in terms of actual state of affairs. But of course, there are some problems to consider this in terms of quantum mechanics. The first is that we have a problem with probability, that we know that 
quantum mechanics involves a non cosmoprobial probability that cannot be interpreted in terms of ignorance, as you well know for the case of showing a cat states. Of course, one could add epistemic probabilities, but then the high price to pay, like in the case of Cubism, is to deny the fact that quantum mechanics talks about physical reality. So then I've lost physics. Quantum mechanics is not anymore uh, a theory that, is, that accounts for reality, that is related to reality, but something completely detached. Then we have problems with quantum superpositions, which contain contradictory properties, in some sense, which we do not clearly understand. So quantum superposition can, can be the superposition of an atom being decayed and an atom not being decayed. And what we know is that we cannot apply an, an ignorance interpretation about the actual state of that atom. The atom is partly decayed and partly not decayed with a certain type of potential. And I believe the most important aspect that relates uh, quantum superpositions to physical reality and also has in, also provides deep problems for its interpretation in terms of the actual realm is the fact that projection operators interpreted in terms of quantum possibilities interact between each other. So we know that quantum probability interacts and that's something very strange that it's difficult to make sense in terms of, of classical physics. There are two main lines of, of research regarding quantum superpositions. One is uh, the, the idea that superpositions describe worlds, that they describe histories, minds, and there are a lot of problems with respect to this line of research. One is the basis problem, then you have the problem of the of decoherence, which only resolves the problem for all practical purposes. But of course, we are discussing about ontology here. We are discussing about how things are, not about how a subject interacts to, with, with a certain system. And, well, I, I just mentioned the failure of Bayesianism to account for an objective description of physical reality, which they don't attempt to do, but that's, that's perfectly okay. Then we have the idea of the possibility of describing, well, superpositions in terms of possibilities of lattices, propensities, potentialities, etc. And I think that the, the criticism made by, by Mauro Dorato is very much to the point. He says, these positions express directly or indirectly those regularities of the world around us that enable us to predict the future. Such a predictive function of disposition should be attentively kept in mind when we will discuss the dispositional nature of microsystems before measurement, in particular when their state is not an atheist state of the relevant observable, as in the case we just discussed. In a word, the use of the language of disposition does not by itself point to a clear ontology underlying the observable phenomena. But especially when the disposition is irreducible, refers to the predictive regularity that phenomena manifest. Consequently, attributing physical systems irre irreducible dispositions, even if one were realist about them, may just result in more or less covered instrumentalism. Okay, so just to sum up. Why are we thinking that quantum superpositions need to be related to physical reality? Well, mainly going back to Griffith's quotation, because if we have a mathematical expression that interacts with different expressions of the types, of course, interaction is stated in, 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 in terms of the mathematics, right? No, not in terms of the concepts. We don't know how they interact. In, in conceptual terms, because we don't know what quantum superpositions are talking about, and evolves according to mathematical equation, 
that allow us to predict at the end of the interactions and evolution certain phenomena, then it seems very difficult not to imply that such expressions must reflect something about physical reality. What is the challenge? Well, to think in conceptual terms about these mathematical expressions. Just to end, I think that a good possibility to, to provide such a, a representation, a good standpoint, would be to reconsider the actualist element of reality, of EPR, not of Einstein, but of EPR, sorry for that, uh, who restricts the understanding of reality only in actualist terms, only in terms of certainty. So the EPR, actualist element of physical reality, says, says if without in any way disturbing a system, we can predict with certainty, that's the part that's really important, with probability equal to one, the value of a physical quantity, it is only then that there exists an element of reality corresponding to that physical quantity. I believe that one can generalize this, this principle, this, this notion of element of reality, and consider, taking into account quantum mechanics, that if we can predict in any way, both probabilistically or with certainty, the value of a physical quantity, then there exists an element of reality corresponding to that quantity. First, taking probability in an objective manner. Thank you very much. the principle of no contradiction, it is only through those principles that one can talk about an object according to him. So th th there is this categorical disposition in the, the, the Neo-Kantian manner. And then we have empiricism which simply presupposes that what we observe in the macro world is unproblematic, is completely unproblematic. So, we start from observability, and observability is not problematic. So, and, and these two elements match in terms of common sense. So we, we, they, they kind of, they kind of uh, find, find a common path, because once we admit that our common sense language has a priority with respect to different types of language that could be developed, well then we are kind of stuck in the classical language. And so the project, the foundational project, is to take quantum mechanics as a formalism and bring it back to the common sense reality. This project does not admit the possibility that quantum mechanics could be talking about a different type of reality. Mm -hmm. It blocks the problem. And that's why the measurement problem exposes very, very well this, this, this attitude because the measurement problem attempts to justify what actuality is, what we observe. So the, the apparatus marks four 
and I want to say why it's not a quantum superposition. But I don't know what a quantum superposition is, and I'm not asking the question. So, so if, if you look to all the papers in, 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 in the foundational philosophical uh, arena, quantum superposition are regarded as something which has to be go has to be out of the picture. Yet they are discussed as spooky, as uh, extravagant, as uh, weird, as well, unwanted guests. So, so the, the idea is, is so it has it's difficult to find uh, apart from actualist approach, such as the many world interpretation uh, interpretations that really discuss the meaning of quantum superposition, which I believe is one of the main, the building blocks of quantum mechanics. If we do not understand what quantum superposition is, then we will not be able to understand the theory. So indeed, we are stuck in kind of a dogmatic language, and then we have a mathematical language, which is mathematics. It's, it's, it's deeply important for, for physical theory, but it's mathematics. And then we use a language which is, doesn't mean anything. We talk about quantum particles, but we're not able to say what quantum particle really is. As we could explain what an object is, as we could explain what a field is, we cannot explain what it is. We, we just use the notion of quantum particle as a negation of the notion of particle, of classical particle. So, so at the end of the talk, the physicists will say, well, it's quantum. So it's really weird. So stop asking. Sorry? When you say, uh, until we understand the superposition or whatever, what do you mean by understand? So, what I just said, creating a language, creating adequate concepts but that allow us to think about what a quantum superposition but really is. There is a language, there is no. a word superposition, no. just no. it doesn't mean anything. Not, not, as not as in the sense of a unity. So, what we, what we, are, what we don't have is the moment of unity of the multiple representations that are provided in terms of specific phenomena in a lab. So what we end up saying is we have these terms and we don't know what these terms are because they are very weird, because they are properties which can be contradictory and at the same time they have certain certain kind of potential because... So we're using them like a crutch. What are you trying to say? So we, we use a language, we, we, we talk about quantum particles and so on, and then we say, okay, and then we have this result. Mm -hmm. so, we go, so we go from, a, of course, a language which is completely incoherent. And then we talk about waves, about particles. But what we have in quantum mechanics are probability waves, right? And what is a probability wave? I mean, it's a very simple question. It's, it's what we're stuck in sports interpretation. And it's a quantum superposition, it's just that. It's two probabilities. A kind of wave of probability, two wave probabilities that can interact with, between each other. And that's how all the new technological era is built. I mean, quantum computers are much faster. We can do quantum teleportation, we can, because we're dealing with the potential level. We're not doing, dealing with actuality. We, we have something, I mean, an actual object cannot be at the same time up and down. It cannot be black and white. It cannot be, I mean, it's, it's non contradictory by definition. By definition of what an object is in categorical terms. So, so what we have, in fact, is an operational language. A meaningful operational language that, that we have. So we know that if we do this, then this will happen. And we know how to do this with the mathematics and the experiment. But we haven't learned how to think about it. And if we do not know how to think about it, beyond mathematics, through the concepts, through the metaphysics that can be developed, well, we will not be able to really grasp what quantum theory is talking about. So you're not talking actually about language. You're talking about learning how to think about it. Because this is no. Because language is also related to metaphysics. 
it's also related to a logic. Classical logic, and the, the Greeks, the very early metaphysics, the principle of existence, non-contradiction and identity, they match the way in which we think. So we think about objects, we have an object, predicate and subject. But this is because this is from and then the, the verbs, in, in fact, are, are secondary in our language. So we, what we have in our language is, is a language that has been derived also through our physical theories. It is not something that just appeared in, in, in a single moment of time. It has been constructed, and it has been constructed and relates to our worldview, our own worldview. So, so it's, it's not, language is not a given. No, I'm talking about, about the fact that, that there might be a possibility that we cannot intuitively understand these certain things. Well, I, I think we can. You think you can? I, I mean, that's what history teaches us. Well, history teaches us that common sense has been developed. That, I mean, and I'm not talking so far away. Eh? Newton's mechanics is from the 17th century. Maxwell's, Maxwell's mechanics. If from the, it's from the 19th century. Okay, so we didn't have the concept of field. The Greeks were not working with the concept of field. So the, the notion of field, for example, which for us is absolutely common sense. Everybody knows what a field is. Even a kid. I can teach to a kid what a, a field means. Without the mathematics. Everybody knows what it is. And it has developed into a common sense. So Either we believe that common sense is something that is developed, and in fact, I believe that physics is always going beyond common sense. The work of physics is to extend the common sense of the future, so to speak. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I'm also a bit puzzled by the, 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 the same questions before. I mean, mathematics, as you've also said, it is a language it's intuitive, like, what well, I don't know what like, I mean, I, I work in a lab and in quantum intro theory and I, I, I believe I have a quite intuitive understanding of uh, what I'm doing and what these uh, photons are doing in the lab and, I mean... So what is a photon? So what is a photon? Uh, operationally, it's, it's... No, no, not operational. <laughs> so my question is... What, what is a photon? The, the, there is this phrase of, of Einstein, which is very good. I mean, the problem is solved if you say what a photon is. So, what is a photon? Well, what is a chair? In, in, the, in the language of quantum mechanics, a photon is a quantized piece of light. Uh, can, can I say quickly? Uh, just but I, mean, I mean, sorry, because this, this. I want to answer this. Because. No, no, I just. Before you do, just, I yeah. just want to interject. We should maybe differentiate between understanding, because we're misusing the word understanding, and the ability to explain something. There's a difference between understanding and what means we use to explain it. You can understand something mathematically, yeah. but then yeah, yeah. the way you explain it, you know, there's a difference there. Yeah, yeah. So, not and word, this concept. So, so it, it would be the same as, as having Maxwell's equation and an operational understanding of Maxwell's equation, but you don't have the notion of field. You don't, you don't have the physical concept of field, but you have Maxwell's equations, and you have, on the other hand, some operations that, that you know how to work with the Maxwell's equation. I mean, of course, if you add the notion of field, well, it's something else, right? I mean, it, the, your possibilities are meant drastically. They, 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 they go exponentially high, as I believe. But this is because there is another point, which is that I am taking the transposition, the mathematics is non-representational. Mathematics doesn't represent anything by itself. And that, that's a kind of, it's, it's also a point which relates to empiricism, which relates theoretical terms to empirical observation. So an empirical theory is something that relates this mathematical theory to data. But then, of course, in the empirical scheme, we are stuck with the problem since Karma, Nagel, Popper, of explaining how you relate mathematics to concepts, to, propos to propositions, to, to a notion such as an object.
Because that's not in mathematics. I mean, the notion of object is not in mathematics. And it's not in the data. So the interpretational rules that you have to add, well, they have metaphysics. They have concepts. And if you, if you are able to make sense of this concept in a classical theory, well, that's it's okay. That in quantum mechanics, we are at a stage where we have the mathematics, we have the empirical data, but we have the clicks, and the clicks are not classical. Bell inequality already tells us that we cannot represent the clicks in classical terms. So why are we treating them as if we understand the clicks? No, on the contrary, the very contrary. Exactly, exactly the opposite. I believe that that mathematics doesn't represent that mathematic mathematics. I work with mathematicians, and they, 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 they don't they don't need to, to know physics. They are only concerned with the coherent structure that they are developing. So they don't have a reference. You can you can do mathematics without any reference. You can do mathematics in a room, without ever leaving that room. You cannot go physics like that. But like, you know, in the sense, like, uh, there is a way out of external world that we have to perceive this right? I think in that respect, you may consider yourself a Sorry? In a, in a way out world uh, that we can perceive in some way, in some future way. I, I, I don't... Of course, the way in which you develop mathematics is something, something else. I, I, I would say the, the, the fact that we live in a world and we develop mathematics in a certain specific sense is.
organization of your, your, your yes. Just to say, yeah, the yes. venue that, that we would have to close my bed. Yes. Uh, okay. with, with, with regards to, to the validity of, uh, of, of, of mathematics, what is not in a better position than, than, than the medical problem. Okay, thank you very much. You know, this is the, the longest discussion. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, we're not going to be able to, to finish this now.